Hey guys, welcome to the Galaxy CDs Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk Podcast, episode number one. That's episode one of this particular format, because if you're looking at the list, you're probably like, what are you talking about episode one? You've got like 25 episodes up. But this is the first dedicated podcast that I'm recording. The, the rest of them, while serviceable, have essentially been audio ripped from my YouTube videos, which they, for the, like I say, for the most part, they've worked. They're the ones that are, you know, obviously kind of required the video to make any sense, like the haul videos where I'm standing at the back of the family truckster and <clears throat> pulling stuff out. Those I haven't tried to transfer here, but this, this podcast will be dedicated, targeted specifically for the audio format. Now, of course, because I'm all about, you know, cross pollinating formats. I am making a video of this and this will go into a, a dedicated uh, playlist on my YouTube channel. So it will be available there. Uh, but that's not kind of the primary goal of this. It's This is strictly an actual podcast. A quick note um, to my YouTube viewers. Uh, you may notice that on the video version of this in the bottom left hand corner, there is a parental advisory label. And I want to let you know, I've made a conscious decision to keep my actual YouTube content family friendly. Um, and I've also made the conscious decision to not necessarily do that same thing here on the podcast. So um, it's not like I'm going to be talking like a drunken sailor for an hour, but I'm not going to self censor in the same way that I do on the actual YouTube videos. So just be aware of that. Um, if this is, if you know, not that I've got a million viewers or listeners, but if you if this is something that you would watch with your kids in the room, just know that the podcast and the, the accompanying video will not necessarily adhere to the same standards <laughs> of uh, family friendliness that the actual videos do. So speaking of the parental advisory label, you know, we'll, ostensibly this podcast is all about reselling, but we're going to start off with a rant and a just ramble, uh, which is how these podcasts generally are going to start. But in any event, the, the parental advisory label, if, if there has ever been an attempt to label something um, with the intent of restricting its distribution, that has been a more spectacular failure than the parental advisory label, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, when I think back, uh, that program started the PMRC and all the hearings, I think it was in 1985. So I was just out of high school. Um, there's an age giveaway for you. And, you know, they, they, they started putting those labels on the, on the records and the cassettes, and it was literally no time at all than that label rather than being kind of a warning to parents to you know monitor the content that their kids were listening to became like the cool kid badge you know the badge of honor if your album didn't have that label on it man it was doa <laughs> nobody wanted that thing and i mean i can remember it seemed like there were albums coming out that you know pop records that had no business having objectionable language in them um, that had it in specifically so that it could get that label because they knew, you know, that's what people were looking for. So, um, you know, let me know, you know, send me a, send me a message or let me know if you're, if you have any other, um, kind of content warning label that's ever been a more spectacular failure than the parental advisory label. Um, I'm probably one of the few pe pe people that's using it, uh, to actually try to warn people. I think for the most part, it's, it became a marketing tool for the record company. So, and uh, to that point, when I, I opened a record store back in 2000 and I hadn't been open, but a month and this, this kid comes in, he's probably 13 years old and he comes up to the counter with the, what was new at the time, uh, Marshall Mathers LP, the Eminem album. And he plops it on the counter and whips out his 15 bucks or whatever and I'm looking at him and, you know, looking at the CD and I'm like, you know, man, this is a really great record, but I, I can't tell you this, the parental advisory label, you're not 18. I just, you know, if you want to come back in with your mom or your dad or whatever, I'll, you know, be more than happy to sell it to you. So he, he gives me a little grief and leaves. And about five minutes later, this woman comes in and she's like, are you the one that just waited on my son for the Eminem album? And I'm like, yeah, my name's Ryan. I'm the owner here. 
And I'm thinking, you know, she's going to say, you know, thank you for doing the right thing and not letting my son buy that record. And she looks at me and she says, if my kid can get in here with $15 to buy that damn CD, sell it to him. I don't want to have to come back in here. <laughs> so at that point, I, I kind of made the decision that I... I was going to, if you could get in there with 15 bucks, I was going to do what mom said. I didn't care who you were or what you were buying. I was going to sell it to you and I would deal with the consequences later. And I was in, I was open and in business for 12 years and I only ever had one other incident with parental advisory label. I had a, a father that came in and I don't even remember what the album was, but his daughter had bought something and he came back with it and he said, Hey, you know, it's not, I'm not mad or anything, and I don't even want my money back, but I really don't want my daughter to have this album with the parental advisory lyric. Um, could you order me an edited version? And I'm like, absolutely. I'll have it for you tomorrow. So um, in 12 years, th those were my two experiences with that. Um, so again, the, the label, you know, I don't know how many CDs parents, you know, broke or threw away, um, but in terms of things that actually came back to my store, that was literally... Uh, one in and one out. So just kind of a side story. So uh, this podcast, I want to talk a little bit about what kind of the format of it is going to be. And uh, ideally, I'm going to do these once a week. And it'll be kind of a longer form content, you know, 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. It will start kind of like this one will just, you know, rant and ramble. And ostensibly, it will be adhering to the topic of reselling, um, but I may drift off onto other topics from time to time. So just, you know, be aware of that. We'll get into kind of reselling news, what's going on in the wider reselling world. I'll do some kind of quick reselling recap for what's going on here during the week at the Galaxy. I already do kind of what sold videos and I transfer that audio to a podcast and I'll continue to do that. So this will be something different. This will be kind of the broad overview how many items I sold, how much money I grossed in sales, what my profit margins percentage-wise were, and that sort of thing. So it'll be a little bit different than what those videos are. So you can get a look globally at my business. And I'll, I'll preface all of that by telling you, I've only been in the resale game for not quite a year. I am full-time at this, but I'm not huge. I'm not one of these resellers that's doing a quarter of a million dollars a year in volume. Um, I'm, I'm tracking to maybe do 75 or 80, um, but I'm making a living. And I think I, I can share that experience and then you can kind of gauge, you know, how you're doing against someone else and, and what they're doing. So that's kind of the goal of that. It's not, you know, I'm not one of these guys that's going to be bragging about, you know, selling $100,000 a week and stuff. That's just not how my business is set up. And it's not really... To be fair, it's not really what I'm aspiring to. You know, if I could do $120,000 a year in sales um, with the margins that I'm doing now, I would make a very satisfactory living. Um, I'm kind of in the uh, that Gary Vaynerchuk mold. He talks pretty frequently about, you know, kids today should not be aspiring necessarily to be millionaires. They should be aspiring to make $70,000 a year, which is a nice, comfortable living. And that's kind of, I've always kind of been that way. If I could make between fifty dollars and $70,000 a year, year in and year out, doing this job, uh, being a reseller, man, I would be ecstatic. Um, I enjoy this. I enjoy talking about it. I enjoy making the videos. Oh, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that in a minute. But um, this is something I really have found kind of a passion for in my work life that other than owning the record store, I've never experienced. And I've had some good jobs and I've worked with some really, really great teams over the years, but I was never completely inspired by the jobs or the places that I worked uh, with the exception of that record store and this business. Um, I genuinely look forward to getting up every day and working my way down into the basement, which is where I do most of my work. And that is worth, for me, a significant amount of money. Um, so there's that. So again, we'll talk about kind of what my business is doing. The last thing I would like to do in these 
um, podcast is talk with other resellers. So if you're a reseller um, and you happen to stumble on this podcast and you'd like to appear on this podcast or have me appear on yours, I'd be happy to go either way on that. And just talk about reselling. Talk about your business and the things you're doing. Because again, I'm fairly new at this. I've only been doing it since last August. And I'm still learning and I'm still picking things up from other resellers. I watch a ton of YouTube videos and listen to, you know, like the Pure Hustle podcast and Scavenger Life and all that kind of stuff. So I'm always learning and trying to grow. And what I would like to do is have conversations with other YouTube content creators, podcasters, and resellers, and ideally people that do two or all three of those things. So we can kind of compare notes and hopefully, you know, give you some inspirational tools and information um, that will help you on your reselling journey. Now, I'm not going to be you know, one of these kind of so-called gurus, uh, a, my, my business is not established enough. It's not big enough and I'm not expert enough to pretend to be a guru. But I think even people like me that are, you know, fairly new to this and having modest levels of success, when we share things that we're doing, whether they're right or wrong, if you're paying attention, you can pick things up and you can learn from that. And that's kind of the goal of this. I'm, I'm not here to try to teach anybody anything. I'm just here to share my experiences and hopefully share with you the experiences of others. And you can do with that information what you will. Um, it's not my goal to, to try to teach anybody or tell anybody, you know, that my business model for reselling is the best one or the only one or whatever. And, you know, there are some guys out there on YouTube that, kind of present themselves as gurus and experts. And I, I watch their videos and I listen to their advice and I'm like, mm, A, that business model doesn't really work for me because again, I'm not aspiring to do a million dollars a year in sales. And I'm, I'm not, I don't want employees. Um, I don't want a staff. I don't want to deal with all that kind of stuff. The whole goal for this, for me, was to be able to work kind of by myself and make a living. And I want, the, I want the business to grow big enough to allow me to do that comfortably, but not to grow so big that I've got to hire additional help. So that's the perspective that I will be coming at these shows from. And that's the kind of thing that I'll be sharing with you as, as we go forward. So if that's your jam, um, you know, follow the podcast or go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, just search Galaxy CDs Rocks, or of course, there'll be links in the show notes and all that. But uh, that's kind of where we're, we're going with this. So... I'll try to keep it interesting and I, you know, I'm not the funniest guy on the planet, but I'll try to keep it fairly lighthearted. So that's kind of where we're going. And, um, I don't have an interview lined up for today. So we are, I am going to talk a little bit about, um, YouTube and podcasting just in general and the kind of the differences in how, you know, one would get started there. Um, but that sound means it's time for a quick sponsor break. So let's get that in and I will be right back. And we're back. I did want to talk a little bit today about as a, a noob on YouTube and a noob to podcasting. And I, I say that having had a YouTube channel some time ago, um, it was about Hot Wheels. I can't even remember how many videos I did. I got up to a couple hundred subscribers, which was always kind of bizarre to me. You know, people subscribing to watch a 50 year old guy mess around with Hot Wheels. But I mean, it was kind of cool. And I didn't, I left that channel up for a long time after I was done posting videos. And probably once or twice a month, I would get a new subscriber. And I'm like, man, I haven't had new content forever. I'm surprised people are still subscribing. But I'm still relatively new to this and to focus like real attention on creating content two or three times a week. And you have that, you know, you feel like you're pouring your blood, sweat and tears into it. And then you look and you've got 28 subscribers and you're averaging, you know, 12 views per video. And you're like, man, is it really worth all this effort and time. And then you look at 
you know, monetization on it. Not that you're doing it for making money, but you, you look at the difference between the threshold for monetizing on YouTube and what you can do with a service like Anchor, who I use to distribute my podcast. And, you know, with YouTube, if, if you're not familiar with their monetization, you know, to run an ad on your videos, you've got to have a thousand subscribers. And I think it's 4,000 hours of content views in the last rolling 12 months. So when I look at my, you know, 26 or 27 videos, and I look at my 28 subscribers and, you know, my, my views are measured in minutes, not hours. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm not weeks or months away from being able to monetize. I'm years away from being able to run ads other than, you know, affiliate links or whatever in the, the descriptions of the videos. And you contrast that with Anchor, who, like, immediately when you sign up, they essentially become a sponsor of your podcast. And you can record a little spot, and it'll play... And regardless of how many listeners you have, you have an opportunity to make some money. Now, it's not a lot of money. I've got, you know, I think I average, uh, the dashboard in Anchor says my average listenership is six as of today. So it's not like there's a million people listening to this podcast yet. Um, so sh share the shit out of this <laughs> for me. So people will start listening because that would really make me happy. But in any event, even with that small of a number, um, if I go into the money portion of the anchor dashboard, I've made like a dollar and 19 cents. So in essentially the same amount of time with significantly less work involved, um, especially since all I've been doing is ripping the audio out of the videos and putting that up anyway. But you know, now this is a little more full on effort to do a podcast, but nonetheless, you know, this will take no time at all to you know, transfer out of my recording device, upload it to Anchor, and have a podcast that's ready to be published um, or scheduled to be published. Where with YouTube, you've got tons of editing to do and, you know, a, a 1080p video uploaded at the best quality will take hours. If it's a 20-minute video, it's going to take four or five hours potentially to upload and process so, I mean, it's an all day adventure and, and you contrast that again with doing the podcast and it's I'm obviously it's a much smaller file size. So I, I get all that. Um, but you look at the difference in the workloads and the potential for, you know, making a little bit of scratch on the deal and podcasting looks pretty good. Not to mention the, you know, the difference in the competition, because you look at podcasting and there are a lot of podcasts and there are a lot, obviously a lot of very, very good ones but it's a much smaller field. You know, YouTube gets whatever it is, a gajillion hours of video content up uploaded every 10 seconds or whatever the numbers are. I mean, it's a staggering amount of content that's being created and pushed to YouTube. So you're up against all of that. And even in a really niche market like reselling, you know, you've got guys out there that have got 100,000 subscribers or more and you know they're sucking all the oxygen out of the room and as a new guy you know you put up what you feel like is reasonably decent content and it's just it's it is this so you, you know reach out to me and if you have any tips on kind of breaking out and breaking through and obviously the level of content and the quality of the content makes a huge difference and I I'm the first to admit that Probably this podcast is average at best, and the videos are average at best. But I also, I, I mean, I've seen and listened to some pretty mediocre stuff where people have literally hundreds, if not thousands, of subscribers, and I watch it and I'm or listen to it, and I'm like, man, what in the world? What am I missing? <laughs> and I understand that part of it is, you know, before you go busting my balls, I've only been doing this for a couple of months, and I, the growth curve and the learning curve are both fairly steep. Um, so I get it, but it, it's fascinating to look at the differences and to, you know, to watch the difference in the growth and the podcast really, it's been interesting because I manually added 
a couple of more distribution channels. So this podcast is now available, I think, on 10 uh, podcast networks, not networks, but, you know, Stitcher and Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all that. And there are a couple that I had to manually add. And having done that, all of a sudden, I've seen my numbers have jumped quite a bit. So I need to go in and do a little more research and see where where people are listening. Um, but it's fascinating because the growth there is actually happening over the last couple of weeks much, much quicker than what I'm what I'm seeing on YouTube. And again, you're probably saying to yourself, Ryan, this none of this has anything to do with reselling. And you would be right. But doing a podcast and doing a YouTube channel about reselling at least is tangentially <laughs> connected. Uh to reselling and it's it's another part of something that I'm interested in and clearly a lot of people are because you know you don't have a channel like for instance Cincinnati Picker on YouTube with 100,000 plus subscribers if people aren't interested. The other thing that I've found interesting and it's a stat that I knew all along but until it, it you know it's happening to you you maybe you don't really appreciate it but the, your number of subscribers has next to nothing to do with how many views a video will actually get you know, with 28 odd subscribers, you know, I've got videos that get six or seven views. And I see the same thing on some of the big channels that, you know, they've got, you know, 250,000 subscribers and any one video you pull up may only have 2,500 views. So th those two things do not necessarily correlate, which makes it surprising to me to some extent that YouTube has that threshold for monetization so high. And I understand that they, you know, it doesn't do them or their advertisers any good to run an ad on a channel that has 28 subscribers and an average of, you know, 10 views. I get it. I'm, I'm not asking really <laughs> that to be monetized today, but the, the thought of a thousand subscribers, I mean, it almost looks, and obviously you see people that have it, but it seems like an almost unreachable goal where the podcast with six listeners, you know, I'm, I'm halfway to being able to buy a beer <laughs> the next time I go out, which God knows when that'll be with all the COVID-19 stuff. But, um, and again, the other thing is, like I said, just the difference in the workload. I mean, creating a video, man, that's a, that's a job. You really got to do it because you love it and enjoy the process. And it has been fun. And you know, I sound like I'm trying to talk myself out of doing YouTube videos and that's not really the case. Um, but it's just, it's fascinating to me, the difference between the two formats and the way they're currently structured. So let me know what you think. I, you know, like I said, I want this to be kind of an open conversation as much as a, a podcast, which is kind of one way directional can be. So um, I think I mentioned, you know, kind of in the first part of this, you know, galaxycds at gmail.com, galaxycdsrocks.com. Um, there's a community board there with sections where, and of course, nobody has said anything but me, but again, the website's only been up for a couple of weeks. So, but go visit there, uh, join the conversation with me and let me know, you know, what you think about the difference between the podcasting and the uh, YouTube videos. So with that, I'm gonna take another quick break and I'll be right back. News updates. So let's take a quick look at some of the uh, headlines that made news over the last, we're, we're going to go a couple of weeks because I really want to touch on the, the situation over at eBay. Um, not so much current eBay employees, but I, and I'm sure you've seen it and it's already been discussed way more than it probably needs to be <laughs> given the scenario. But if, if you hadn't heard, uh, six former eBay employees are charged with harassing a couple who had criticized them and sending them obscene messages, mailing them live insects and a Halloween mask featuring a bloody pig face and so on and so forth. And just, man, I've, I've said for years that everything is high school or middle school. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're in the C-suite or you're, you know, working on the line, everything ends up being middle school. People just doing stupid shit to each other. And this is a classic example of, you know, the eBay former senior director of safety and security and a director of global resiliency conspiring 
against a couple of bloggers and sending, you know, harassing messages and discussing, you know, taking them down and burning them to the ground and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable to me. And yet at the same time, it's not really, because like I said, everything is high school, but it's just fascinating that that kind of stuff. And, and to think that they thought that they could do it and not get caught. I mean, any communication that you conduct today is being monitored essentially in some way or another, or it can certainly be tracked if you're sending emails or texts or, you know, trying to use a burner phone, it doesn't really matter. Eventually they're going to find you. Um, the other thing that really, and he's, he's the former CEO now, so I guess it doesn't really affect eBay directly, but, um, as this you know, scandal was erupting, you know, the former CEO claims that he was shocked to hear details of the campaign and that he gave no direction or tacit approval for it. That sounds different to me than I didn't know anything about it. Uh, that sounds like he was, maybe if he wasn't directly involved, he was in a position where they were not filling him in on the details, so he had uh, plausible deniability. But it just doesn't sound, doesn't pass the sniff test for me. So I don't know. I don't want to, you know, pronounce someone guilty before the trial has taken place. But man, the the indictment is pretty damning. Uh, his quote was essentially, on Monday, I read the charges along with everyone else and was shocked and outraged. It is important for me to reiterate and an independent investigation confirmed that I had nothing to do with and no knowledge of the activities alleged to have occurred. There was no direction, no knowledge, no private understanding, no tacit approval ever. And as several of the articles have, have said, the, the idea that the security team and this group of individuals felt comfortable conducting a campaign like that against essentially private citizens and bloggers who are just exercising their right to criticize the platform, which that's another topic altogether. I think there's way too much criticism by users of eBay, of eBay, but we'll, that's a topic for another podcast. But the idea that this group of people felt comfortable executing something like this against private citizens indicates to me that there are certainly at the very least blind spots within the company organization about what their people are doing and at worst uh, a really broken culture at kind of the corporate executive level because this kind of stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum you know a well-run well-managed company does not often at least have people running off the deep end pulling this kind of stuff i mean it was uh it was amazing the u.s attorney's office in massachusetts when they revealed the case um called it an aggressive cyber stalking campaign against this husband and wife team um that run a i guess it's e-commerce bites is the name of the the blog and it's probably this has probably done nothing but blow up their blog. I mean, they're probably more popular now than they ever were. <laughs> so, uh, but, but good on them. Um, you know, hopefully uh, some of the stuff, if you've re not read through this, I mean, some of the, some of the shit these guys did was, it's just, it's unreal. Uh, they sent a funeral wreath, a book on surviving the loss of a spouse, uh, pornography. Um, they sent things to these people's neighbors, um, you know, casting aspersions on these people. And it was just, uh, they apparently considered breaking into their garage to place a GPS tracking device on their vehicle. I mean, it's just remarkable. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that whole thing shakes out. And the other thing that I guess I would comment on is, and I've talked about this with friends on other topics, I don't know how much those folks not in the reselling business really know about this or care. Um, I don't, it hasn't, certainly has not affected my sales in any way. And it doesn't appear to have affected eBay's sales. Now within the eBay user community, obviously this was a, you know, a huge scandal, but I think the wider world may have seen the headline and just been like, uh, you know, more corporate shenanigans and just moved on to the next thing. And they, it doesn't factor into their purchase equation really at all. 
And I, I'll draw on an experience I had. I worked for Volkswagen um, at a dealership. I didn't work for Volkswagen per se, but I, w- I was in auto sales for Volkswagen at the time that the TDI diesel emissions scandal broke and took place. And, you know, as an employee of the company and as someone trying to sell their cars, you know, we were kind of in the thick of it. And it seemed like every time I turned on the news, I was seeing a headline and seeing a story or an article about that scandal. And, you know, it definitely had an impact globally on Volkswagen sales. But I was constantly amazed at the number of people that would come into the dealership that had never heard about it. They had no clue, no idea that anything was wrong. I mean, the the TDIs went on stop sale almost immediately. You know, one day we were selling them and the next day it was over and they were never going to be sold again. And it was, I mean, this went on for months and you would still have people come into the dealership. Now I'd like to look at one of your, you know, Jetta TDIs or whatever it was and you couldn't sell them. And these people had no idea. They'd never heard any of this stuff. And to us, it had been all over the news. It was the only thing anybody was talking about, but because that, it was within our bubble, I guess. And I think this is kind of the same thing. I don't think the average Joe that's buying stuff on eBay has any clue that this is going on or that they frankly care at all. And I think that's reflected in the next kind of news topic, eBay's stock. Um, man, I think I own some of it in a fund, but I don't own any of it directly, but it is up. Um, at one point last week, it actually was at a record high. Um, I think Yahoo News reports uh, that it hit a 52-week high. Wanting to know, you know, will that run continue? It's up uh, 14.1% over the last month. Um, so remarkable. Again, you know, and a lot of this is, as sad as this is to say, this is kind of pandemic driven. I don't know what your sales look like. I can tell you, you know, when the, when states started going into lockdown back in early March, the first couple of weeks of that, I, I saw a noticeable dip in my sales. And then, you know, I think once the reality set in, at least for online shopping, people not only went back to normal, they went into like hyperdrive. Um, and I made the joke at the post office one day that I I was selling books to people that probably hadn't picked up a book in years (laughs) because I was selling and still am selling just dozens of books. And I I think eBay and e-commerce in general has seen a huge gain in sales because people have been, you know, cooped up at home and they can't go to the stores and, you know, they're looking for stuff to do. So I know, you know, items like puzzles and games and video games. Um, and like I said, books, that kind of stuff just went through the roof. And it seems to have continued to do so. And I think the tides have probably turned and you're seeing a lot of traditional retail that is unfortunately kind of putting the padlocks on the doors. They're folding up. And I think they see the writing on the wall, other than, you know, the big ones, Walmart and places like that. You know, people's shopping habits have been changed by this pandemic. And those who maybe were not shopping a ton online now are, and they've seen the convenience of it and the quickness of it. And even with, you know, the delays that, you know, a company like Amazon was having for a while where, you know, stuff that normally was next day or two day was taking a week or whatever, because they were prioritizing what they shipped and when I don't, I don't think there's any going back. I think traditional retail is in, in a jam, uh, the big, you know, the targets and the Walmarts of the world that will continue to survive. Um, but a lot of that specialty retail, you know, a place like GameStop, which, you know, I don't know how their business has survived as long as it has anyway, but when you combine online shopping with, you know, downloadable games, I just, I don't see how traditional retail specialty stores like that are going to continue to make it. So, so those are kind of some of the bigger news headlines over the last couple of weeks. Um, There was a note on Barron's that eBay is potentially looking at selling off their classifieds division, which could be a, a huge influx of cash to the company. Um, they were all about it. They think it'll help the stock in the long term. So we'll we'll see we'll see what happens with that. There was also um, I don't know if you follow if you're on the eBay community page 
ever. Um, but there were some interesting, I'd recommend that you go check it out. They did, um, if you have Seller Hub down at the bottom, they generally have some news headlines and they answered some questions that users had about the um, eBay's big thing for June was driving traffic month. And it was interesting, some of the questions, the one that really stuck out to me was someone who was complaining about the fact that eBay runs ads for sponsored items from other people on their listings. And I totally get that that's frustrating. You know, you, you put your heart and soul into creating a listing and then somebody goes and they look at your listing and, you know, halfway down the page, there's a sponsored link to someone else's listing eBay doesn't care. <laughs> Let's just be completely frank. Their goal is to sell as much merchandise for as much money as possible. And if someone is willing to, you know, pony up for a sponsored listing or a promoted listing, they're going to they're going to promote it. They're going to do what they said when that person agreed to pay extra to have that listing sponsored and or promoted. So, you know, it's hard to fault eBay for that. And the other thing I would say is, you know, it's incumbent on us as sellers to make sure our listings are competitive, to make sure, you know, we've got good pictures and good information. And so when the person is looking at that listing and they see, you know, a sponsored listing pop up, they're not enticed to click on it because they've got all the information they need. You've got the right item. You've got it at a competitive price. You've got enough pictures and enough information that they're ready to make that purchase. So if we're doing our job as sellers, Somebody else's listing popping up on my listing, well, certainly not ideal, uh, just really shouldn't be a deal breaker for anybody. So anyway, that's that's probably more commentary really than news, but that's kind of the what's been going on in the uh, the world of eBay, at least over the last week. So it's time for a little look at the the galaxy business over the last week so what i want to do i'll just talk about broadly my i'm taking this directly off my p l and I'll, I'll give you a little uh, slice of how i track my expenses so every day um, when i do my listings and do my sales i record it into a spreadsheet and then i further record that into accounting software and the only expense that I do not account for in that are the eBay fees, because I account for that once a month when I get my eBay invoice. Um, at this point, tracking all of that individually is just a, a bridge too far for me. So I don't do that. Uh, but I do track my shipping cost and my PayPal fees and taxes and you know, that come out and all that kind of stuff. So I have a really good picture of where I'm at minus what the eBay fees are. And I'm always looking at that. Again, it shows up if you're on Seller Hub. If you have a store, you can see that real quick. You can, I scan to the bottom of the page and I see I've racked up $300 in fees for the month so far. So I've got a pretty good idea where it at, it's at, but it doesn't. it's not reflected in my daily number. It's um, only ref reflected once a month. So I have one really bad day <laughs> on my P&L every month where I take that you know, four, five, six, seven hundred dollar hit um, for eBay fees. So uh, sometimes these these numbers are a little exaggerated because you've got what, what should amount to twenty five percent of that fee that should be coming out of this number right now, but it, it's not gonna. It's gonna come out all at once in one big chunk. With that being said, um, what I really want to focus on is just kind of the the margins. And I I'm again would be curious what your margins are and leave me a comment, reach out to me, you know, hit me up on galaxycdsrocks.com or galaxycds at gmail.com. Um, if, and if you want to discuss this on the show, uh, hit me up and we can, we can do a whole session on this, but for last week and I track my business from, uh, Sunday through Saturday. So it's the full seven days starting on Sunday and running through Saturday's close of business of the things that I actually process the orders for. So this is a little different than what might be sitting in the eBay numbers. And a lot of times that that's not, those numbers aren't super accurate anyway, because they include all the taxes and all that jazz. So for last week, um, I did just short of a thousand dollars in sales. Um, it's on my books at 999.51. Uh, when I first got into 
doing reselling, my kind of my target number uh, was a hundred bucks a day in sales. And I was able to get to that number pretty quickly. And now my number is uh, that my net profit, again, less the eBay fees is a hundred dollars a day. So my goal is before taxes and before eBay fees to be able to make 700 bucks. So for last week, my, my cost of goods sold was a whopping $55 and 83 cents. So my gross margin percentage was 94.41%. Um, which when I owned my record store, th that number was practically in inverted. Um, I was lucky if I made 10% gross margin. I mean, the mu music business is just terrible for margins. So seeing numbers like that is it really gets me pretty stoked. Um, this is the result of doing a lot of big kind of bulk buys, um, big lots of books, big lots of magazines and CDs and Blu-rays and DVDs that I'm buying super, super cheap. And I'm flipping at reasonably good prices. Now, if you if you watch my YouTube channel at all, um, I've mentioned that I do generally something like an average of 15 transactions a day at an average of about 15 bucks a transaction. So I'm not selling big, big stuff. I'm selling tons of smalls and doing a reasonable amount of volume and I'm doing it at crazy gross margins. So, and you know, my shipping expense is in any given week, my biggest expense. I spent almost $300 last week in shipping. Um, last week, my net profit was only about 14% because I took a charge for some office equipment that I needed. So that went on to my books and that was about 600 bucks. So I still may, even with that, you know, my net profit for the week was, uh, about $140 and I've got a huge expense for some new equipment that I needed. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to complain about that. And that, that's stuff that, I mean, it's, it comes off your income. It comes off your taxes. It's stuff you need. You got to do it. So it wasn't, you know, if you take that out, my net profit percentage was probably closer to 50%, which is about where I want to be because that charge for, uh, it's on my books for computer hardware was $640. So mine, if you take that out of the equation, my profit for the week was about 770, which is essentially right on target. So I was fairly happy with how last week went. Um, Again, reach out and let me know. I'd love to have a discussion about, you know, kind of what your targets are, what your goals are, uh, you know, obviously full-time versus part-time. I'm a single guy with essentially no debt. I have a house payment and a car lease, um, and that's about it, unless I rack up some credit card debt, you know, buying equipment or buying supplies or whatever for the business. So I don't, my situation is vastly different from somebody who has, you know, a family and two or three kids and a mortgage and two car payments and, you know, kids getting ready for college and all that. So these are numbers that I can afford to live on that other folks maybe could not do so. So that's that just kind of give you a little background on where I'm coming from with that. So with that... I think I've done about all the damage I can do for this time. So we're going to close it up. I appreciate you stopping by. You've been listening to the Galaxy CDs Rocks and Flips Reseller Talk podcast, and we will see you next week.